Hello, everybody. I believe you can see me. Um, there's a massive delay when I try to look at this on YouTube. It's like three minutes delay. So I do apologize for keeping you waiting. Um, hello, and welcome to my lockdown lecture. This is a bit strange to be doing this in the living room, but here we go. Um, my name's Jamie Ward, and I'm a lecturer in machine learning at Goldsmiths. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of my research that I've been doing over the last few years and try to connect it a little bit to the current situation of us all being locked down. Now, my work is in uh, theatre. I worked as an actor for many years and I also worked as an engineer making wearable computers and I also worked as a, a social neuroscientist. So I, I try to combine these three worlds in my current research. And today's talk will touch on those topics. So the title is The Laboratory of Theatre, What Science Can Learn from Live Performance. And the idea behind this is, um, it came from, I was working for some time at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience at UCL. And I was interested, I was working with Antonia Hamilton there in the social neuroscience lab. And I was interested in studying how nonverbal signals work, basically what happens when we communicate with one another uh, non-verbally. So the content of our speech is obviously important, but the little gestures we make and the eye contacts and the little movements of the head. So we did a lot of studies in that area and I specialized in a particular area related to specifically head nods and the ideas behind that. Now, why is this useful? Well, the thing is, it's something that we all do in our daily life. We all interact non-verbally. But many people struggle with that. And um, in particular conditions like autism, there can be difficulties with this non-verbal communication. So it's useful to study this, to understand it, to be able to perhaps help people who struggle with those signals. And the other side of it, my interest in theatre, is exploring social interactions from... Um, from a, a sort of more, maybe perhaps a more personal perspective. People try to um, perform on stage, so actors are performing on stage, they're trying to pretend to be someone else in a, as truthful a way as possible. And through this they try to reenact or to create realistic life-like situations on stage, obviously all condensed to make it interesting and entertaining. And this struck me as a very useful environment to record data to study real-world social interactions. And I'll come to that in a little bit. Now, all of these research topics, they, are, they come together with this emphasis on real face-to-face -face human beings having a conversation with each other, which obviously has a relevance to what's going on right now. So, let's start. I'll pose a question. Are you listening? I don't bloody know. Normally, if this was done in a lecture theatre, I could see your faces and I could probably gauge by the looks of the forlorn expressions in your faces or the sort of your eye looking at your phone that you weren't listening or you weren't gazing intently at me, perhaps you were listening. There are other signals we send as well beyond just the eye contact. When we're not looking at each other's faces, we can maybe send non-verbal signals like nodding and, and uh, little, little micro-movements of the head to indicate, yeah, we're interested in what's being said. Obviously, in this case, I'd, I've got none of that. All I've got is a little chat box down here where people can write to me with a five-minute delay. That's obviously not ideal. But how can we work with that? Let's have a little look at one of the most basic non-verbal social interactions. One of the most basic non-verbal signals, the nod. A few years ago, um, uh, led by Joe Hale at Antonia Hamilton's lab, um, supported by myself, studied this um, structured conversation in dyads, in pairs of people. And they set up a, an environment where one person would have all the information, they'd have a picture, and they would describe that picture to another person. And the other person would just listen, taking in this new information. They would then discuss the picture and then they would swap places. Now, based on that data set, we were able to look at this structured conversation and analyse the different patterns of movement that people made. Specifically, looking at the head nods, so these movements here, these sort of vertical pitch movements of our heads. And we looked at how well two people moved together. Were they in sync? Were they moving at the same time? 
or not. Now I'm just going to brush over this diagram. Uh, it, you don't need to follow it in too, in too, de too much detail, but along the x-axis is frequency. So basically the higher end, uh, we're talking in hertz, we're talking say the top end there's eight hertz. That's very, 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 very fast nodding. And at the lower end, 0.25 hertz, well, that's like about, you know, nodding once every four seconds. So slow. And what we discovered, that there was a significant factor. So there was an effect size here. So there's positive effect size for slow nods. What that means in layman's terms was that for the slow nodding behavior, people tended to nod in sync with one another. One person nodded, the other person would nod also in a very sort of slow, methodical way. And you can imagine that being, your, you know, you're your discussing a topic and you, you, have, you, you have changes in turn. You may have turn taking or you might have um, other non-verbal signaling mechanisms that would go on. They'd be relatively slow. But crucially, we also found that that synchronicity um, happened, you know, the response between one person and the other was actually fairly quick. So it was almost a, like an automatic response that people were doing. They decided they were going to agree with what was being said or disagree and nod accordingly. So that was interesting. But the previous literature had supported this idea of synchronicity in communication. However, something interesting happened at the fast end. In this active decoupling, essentially fast nods, and this is what we're talking like, you know, around four hertz, like quite fast. What we discovered was that there was the opposite. The people were not synchronized at all. They were um, the opposite of synchronized. They were, they were, they were sort of... Um, uh, hypo and hypo coherence, we, we called it. Basically, if one person was nodding fast, the other person would not. And this some, sort of seemed to correspond in future uh, analyses of this to listening behavior. So if one person was talking, describing the picture, the other person would be perhaps nodding their head quite fast. Maybe one or two nods, but, but fairly sharp and fairly fast. So there was a, we found this link between fast nods and listening behavior. Drawing on that experiment, we wanted to try and figure out, could we study this in a more, um, look at different contexts of conversation? So there's this information sharing, which is the picture description task, which I just spoke about. But um, we're also interested in this idea of you go to see a movie together and then you come back and you have a conversation about it. So you've both got the same information, but you just, you know, recall that information together. So this shared recall and we created a task called a video discussion task um, to, to, to mimic that. And a third category is when you both are bringing new information to the table. So there's new information being come in in a very unstructured way. So uh, there's a task we had called the meal planning task. And that's where you have to decide on a meal to make with your partner based on ingredients that neither of you like. So you have to agree to dislike. You, you have to agree on ingredients that both of you really hate so you can make the most disgusting meal possible. Now, this was a fun task and people, participants tended to enjoy doing it. So there was a lot of laughter, a lot of unstructured social behaviours going on. So it was close to a kind of real world conversation and it kept flowing as it was going. Now, to record that, we used a, a, a motion capture set up in a laboratory at UCL. And this is um, a visual motion, motion, a motion capture system that was able to really get high definition movements that we've recreated here on the screen. Now, this is where we, we can really analyze every movement of the body, but also the participants were wearing eye trackers, wearable eye trackers that allowed us to um, get a video of what where the person was looking, each person was looking, and also a little video of that person's eye so that we could figure out where it was they were looking at any one time. And we recorded this data over many, many dyads and did those three experiments on them. Now, there's a lot of data here to analyze. I'm not going to present all of that, but what we have um, specifically was trying to look at specifically just the nodding behavior. So if we extracted um, just the movement of the head, we could start to um, analyze that in the way that we did previously. Um, incidentally, while I mention that, the other thing we recorded was audio. And we wanted to record what they were, what they were talking about too. It's quite expensive to do transcription. So we tried to do it automatedly using um, IBM Watson. And this is kind of the result.
It was not very successful at getting the actual content. They were not talking about addressing rallies on the very heath, but it was it did allow us to get the specific timings of when people were talking. So we had all this rich information, but again, that's a discussion for another day. What we were interested specifically here in is head nods. When I did the previous did, repeated the previous analysis, looking at the, the wavelet coherence analysis, which is a, is a method um, that you can ask me about if you want at the end, um, to measure the synchrony, so are we moving together at certain frequencies or not, we found that there was a greater than baseline chance of um, synchrony at the low frequencies in the information sharing task. And we also found this hypocoherence, this fast nod decoupling at the high frequencies. So that's a repeat of the previous finding from the previous study with Joe Hale. In the shared recall task, so we both have information um, that's the same, and we're just regurgitating what it was we saw, we didn't find any effect. So there were are less interesting nod patterns going on here. Um, certainly in terms of synchrony, people were not synchronizing quite as much in that particular task. In another unstructured task, the joint meal planning task, there was a little bit of synchrony, but not necessarily significant after correction of the, um, the slow frequencies. Now, there's a lot, of, um, a lot more freedom in this task to talk and move around, so this perhaps influenced that. But crucially, what we did find was this fast nod behaviour really shone through. We really had this hypocoherence at the fast nods. And what this sort of seemed to indicate, that this fast nod um, so listening behaviour corresponds to the, the context of the conversation that's been had. So it's not just what the person is saying that they're listening, it's, it's that it's new information. So they're listening to new information receiving. Uh, this, this, this study was conducted by Patrick Falk and uh, is currently still in preparation and analysis um, for publication. But that's just a little taster of what we found in that so far. Now, nodding behaviour is one way of interacting. Perhaps the most useful for many is gaze. It's the eye. Where does the eye look? Now, the eye is unique in that it boasts, it both perceives the world around us and it also signals the world around us. It is both signalling and perceiving. It tells us what's going on and it tells others what we're, what we're doing or thinking. And there's many functions of this. There's a lot of work in this area looking at, well, d d gaze is related to the regulation of interaction. So um, when I'm talking and I'm about to give up speaking, I will look to you and it's your turn to talk. So it's used in turn-taking behaviour. It's used in monitoring other people's attention, like, can I see, are you looking or not? And expressing agreement or dislike, you know, the eye gestures you can make or subtle, subtle gest um, movements of the eye. Uh, this study by Rosa uh, Caniguela, Caniguero was looking at um, something that's quite relevant to our current situation. She wanted to find out, so we can interact with people face to face, and this is a, a, in, in real life. We can also do it over video call, or video conference call. At the time, this was a few years ago, we, we studied it using the Zoom um, teleconferencing platform. Uh, we were ahead of the curve on that one. We didn't know it was going to become so popular so quickly, sadly. And we wanted to compare the difference between uh, real conversation, video call conversation, and then a sort of pseudo conversation with a, a video. So basically a pre-recorded video where you answer a question based on what was asked in that video. So there was no two-way interaction. And we can analyse this in, in a way that the video, you know, the person knew they weren't being watched. Um, and, you know, there was no information on true gaze direction. What I mean by that is if I look at the camera, I'm looking at the camera, I'm not necessarily looking at your eyes. If I look at the eyes, they're further down on the screen. So it's not quite aligned um, in the same way that real life is. Video call, you can tell you're being watched, you know you're on video. But there's no true gaze direction for the same reason the camera is separate from where the person's eyes are. Just a facet of the technology. And in real, you know you're being watched and you know you've got true gaze direction because there's a real person there. The way we set it up, we had this cardboard box, like a screen, and there was um, you know, basically a screen on one end that the person could interact with. And then we took the screen away and put a real person on the other end so that their head was just about the same size as it was when they were doing the screen so we could compare these things. So it's quite an artificial construct, but, you know, 
What we found, um, in, well, briefly what we found, there was a lot of things from this, but um, it kind of aligned to what we expected and what the literature said, that, um, you know, the video call, people, in terms of uh, one of the analysis, was looking at the eyes of the Confederates. So if um, we had an actor on the screen, an actor on the other side, and they had a, a particular speech to say, um, when they spoke um, on the video call, the participant would look to their eyes much longer, statistically longer, than they would in real life. And also than they would during the video call. Um, so there is something in there about like the, the social functioning of gaze. You, you, there's this idea of arousal that if you're, if you're staring at someone's eyes, it can be a little bit uncomfortable. But if they can't see you staring at their eyes, you might look at their eyes a little bit longer. Crucially, though, we didn't really find a big difference between the conference call and the video call. It's the conference call and real life. And that kind of supported this idea that, um, that many of us are kind of finding when you use video conferencing, it is a little bit more natural, a little bit more real life than just having, um, well, just watching television or perhaps just being on telephone. Now, I'm going to finish talking about the laboratory stuff now, um, but one thing I'm going to end on this w with was one of the studies, reasons we were doing this study, we were interested in studying autism. So I mentioned that one of the core drivers in studying social interactions is to try and understand cases where social interactions don't work so well. And in, in many cases with autism, those nonverbal social signals, the eye contact, don't always work so well. Previous studies have tended to show that um, people, uh, autistic people, are less likely to look at the eyes of a person they're talking to. But when we did this study, we actually found the, the pattern was pretty much the same as the neurotypical when we did this with autistic people. Um, and, and, and also that the fact that there wasn't really that much difference. They, in the real case, in fact, we found that the autistic people looked more to the eyes of the other part of the confederate specifically at the start of the exercise so when the, the the conversation was just about to begin the autistic person gazed more at the eyes of the confederate than a neurotypical would there's a lot of possible reasons behind that one of them is possibly because it was a very structured conversation um, one of them could also be because of the autistic people that were our participants here they were um you know, um, for want of a better phrase, high-functioning autistic, but they were people who had learned to adapt to social situations, so perhaps had learned that, yes, eye contact is important, so I'm going to make a point of doing that. Um, but there's further study needed on that, but it was an interesting finding. Okay. Let's move on to the, um, the theatre side of things. So one of the things that's interesting about theatre, and Hitchcock said this, it's real life with all the dull bits taken out. It allows you to explore, you know, the nature of humanity, the nature of human social interaction, and in a very sort of bite-sized way, if you like. And it's repeatable. A performance can be put on night after night after night with the same, essentially the same actions, the same performance, the, the same words, the same story, but there's always something slightly different each time. So there's sufficient, general, there's sufficient um, difference in there to make the data quite interesting. Key is that the audience watching it, hopefully, will believe what is happening. So it's a realistic data, or it can be realistic. It's socially engaging, and for us, as scientists, we want to record lots of data. We want to record data about movement and eye contact. This requires technology. Now, before we were using motion capture, in a theatre or in the real world, that can be quite difficult to do. But there's lots of wearable tech, and a lot of my research is building sensors. Um, so these are spectacles, Jen's meme, that have got sensors inside that detect the head movement as well as the eye movement. Um, there's these things like the Oura ring, which also um, uh, detects movement and um, uh, heart rate. So there are all kinds of sensors we can use, and, and that's what I've been using in my research now, applying wearable sensing in the theatre environment to try and understand what's going on. Um, I'm about to start in an ERC pr project with Guido Orgs in psychology, and um, we're studying this idea of liveness, the importance of liveness. It's, you know, it's fine to sit and watch a movie, but there's something about being in the room. There's something about watching performers on stage, whether they're doing dance or theatre. And 
the, the project aims to look at that and to explore that in a lot more detail and to, um, to, to eke out what it means. And it's particularly important right now as we're all sort of locked down in this situation. We're unable to engage with live theatre or live music or live dance. But I think many of us are missing it. So as and when we're able to get back to that, um, it's, I think it's a very useful thing to be studying. As a precursor to that, um, you know, Guido, Daniel Richardson and Antonia Hamilton, so this was driven by Antonia Hamilton and myself, um, did a, uh, a two evenings of performance at the Bloomsbury Theatre uh, last year. And you can look up the details here, Deconstructing the Dream. And what we were doing is uh, we were putting motion sensors, so little tiny motion sensors that were put into headbands, and we stuck them on the heads of audience members, so up to 50 audience members. We also stuck sensors on all the actors that were on stage. And we were simply looking at the movement energy, the amount of head movement. Now, there are two things you can do with that. One of the things is we, um, we created a visualisation. That was some Goldsmith students that, that produced that together um, to, to create a nice visualisation on screen based on the head movements of the people and whether people were moving together or not. It would make these circles pulsate. And that was a kind of fun thing to do. But the other thing we did was um, to record all of these movement signals from each of the people that were involved. So I'm going to show you this graph. It's obviously it's a lot of lines. Imagine each line is the data recorded from a single person, each coloured line. And along the, along the x-axis, the time. Um, so that's from 1930 to 2045. So that's about, yeah, just, a, just, just, just over an hour. Um, around about the after the interval at the performance. And what we've got here are audience members and performers. And you can see like the different movement patterns happening. Um, crucially, here are the performers. They are very still during the interval, or they've taken the sensors off. And um, that's this period uh, at the, towards the beginning. And there's a kind of, the lines are very straight. But then the lines start moving up and down a lot. And that's during the actual performance. The, app, the, the audience, that's all the other people, Oops, everyone else basically, they're a lot more still there. They're sat in their seats watching. So that's the interval. The audience are up and about. You can see that there's a lot more movement happening there. And about um, towards the end of the performance, some, some audience members, so a small number, I think there's one, two, three, four, five, six, six yeah, seven, seven or eight audience members were asked to come up on stage and this is where they broke this, they totally broke the fourth wall. They brought these audience members up on stage and they got them to do a little bit of performance. So it was interactive. And you can see the movement patterns of these people um, here. You can, if you look closely, you can see that those patterns are very, very similar. So everyone was moving together. There was a synchronicity in it. Now, this is interesting because a lot of the work that was done um, previously, so some of the work by Guido Orgs and um, Daniel Richardson um, and Joe Devlin, were looking at this idea of um, if people sync together, if they move together, then they like one another more, they, they, they bond together more. So there's a lot of sort of social implications of this. And what we wanted to study here was, could we study these synchronous react relationships between audience members, um, between the actors and um, the particular audience members who were participants? Did they feel more engaged with the performance as a consequence of going up on stage? This data is still being analysed and we're still doing some work on this, but it's just a sort of little taster of the kind of data that we can collect. And crucially, because we've got these tiny wearable sensors, we can put them on hundreds and hundreds of people and do large, large data collections. Now, there's another component of this, which is a social neuroscience point of view, and it's trying to understand what's going on inside the brain. So performers, they put on a character. Um, but what can we understand about that? We really know nothing about what goes on in the brain when someone's pretending to be someone else. Antonia Hamilton set up this nice experiment um, during the rehearsals of Deconstructing the Dream, where the actors were kitted up with body motion capture suits, but also, crucially, functional near-infrared spectroscopy uh, headsets that basically monitored the haemoglobin patterns in their brain, their brain, their, their brain activity. So we were able to monitor uh, brain activity while doing scenes. Two interesting findings so far. Again, the data is still being analysed. Um, you can look this up on the website, Deconstructing the Dream. One is the concept of self 
that is, is very powerful to us. And tied to that is, is the tag, our name. And when we're very young, we learn to connect to our own name very, very strongly. And there's a part of the medial prefrontal cortex of the brain that studies have shown previously, if you say a person's name randomly out of any kind of, you know, whatever's going on, you say the person's name, there's a particular area which activates. And our hypothesis was that in actors, we would see that, but when they were performing as another character, being someone else and really into that character, we thought that that area would not show up as much if we randomly called up their name while that person was performing. The reverse was true. So the actors were rehearsing a scene and they were thoroughly into it. And then randomly someone would call out the actor's real name. And we actually found that the, that area of the brain got even stronger, lit up even more when they were sort of, well, broken out of character by hearing their own name. So there's some interesting things to study in that and further um, to, to look into it further about this idea of the self and, and how performers relate to themselves and do they have a higher connection to their own, um, you know, their, their, themselves. You could, you could say a lot about that. Um, the second study uh, that, I'll, that I'll wrap up with the brain stuff on was looking at this idea of um, these, the, the mirror neurons. So when we move together, when we watch someone moving, um, or doing something, the same areas of our brains will light up as would do if we were doing that thing itself. Um, now, that's if you're doing the same activity. In this particular example, two actors, so we're doing hyperscanning, scanning the brain of two actors simultaneously. Two actors did um, uh, reacted to one another, so they weren't doing the same movement. One actor would do one thing, the other would react to it. So it was a highly coordinated movement. And what we found during that coordination was that pretty much the same areas of both actors' brains uh, showed activity. So there was a correlation between the brain activity of both actors when they were doing a coordinated activity. But that's studying the brain, and that's a hard thing to do. One of the key application areas that I mentioned before is studying autism. And can we understand what happens in the brain of autistic people, particularly autistic people that, are, that have difficulty with speech or are unable to communicate effectively? Now, it's very hard to put scanners on um, people in the real world, uh, brain scanners in particular, as they're going about their daily business. It's even pretty hard to put them on people while they're in theatre. There's a lot of wires. There's a lot of issues with that. So we tried to explore another way of doing this. And... Um, I, we worked together with this company called Flute Theatre run by Kelly Hunter. Now, Flute Theatre specialise in working with autistic children who have um, additional needs, the children with learning disabilities, um, both physical and in communicative. And they are able to do these theatre performances, which are really quite remarkable. They get children who otherwise don't appear to be socially engaged to engage, to move, to synchronise with performers. It's quite a remarkable thing to watch this and it really has a big impact on these children's lives. But what is it? why is it that interaction with actors in this performance setting can have such a strong effect? Playing a series of theatre games, how, how can that have such a strong effect? We can't put brain scanners on these children. The, the, the brain scanner costs a lot of money, so it won't last very long for starters. But what we can do is try and look at this movement synchrony idea. Now, before I was looking at head synchrony, but we could also look at other aspects of body synchrony and body movement. So let me uh, show you a little example of, this is overview of two actors doing a bit of performance for flute. There's a lot of music, there's a lot of repetition of scenes from Shakespeare. So the actors will do a little scene. And the children and other actors will sit round in the circle. Then actors will bring in children to take part and reenact those scenes on stage. So that's generally how flute theatre performances work. Crucially, these children manage to maintain their attention for over two hours, and it's really quite amazing to watch. So what we see here is. Uh, children being guided, but also reacting and coordinating on their own, mimicking 
Um, there's a, a lot of uh, you know, shared attention, joint attention, all of this stuff is going on here. So it's a really fascinating fulcrum to study social interaction in autism, particularly among um, children and some adults. We've had some adults doing this. So to study it, how do we study this? We don't have brain scanners. We could sit there and try and watch everybody, but that's very hard to do. So we used movement sensors. We put these empatica wrist sensors on the wrists of all of the participants. These are the actors all wearing this sensor. This sensor records movement, heart rate, electrodermal activity, but all we are interested in here is overall movement. So how much movement is there? If there's a lot of movement, the signal will go like this. If there's a little bit of movement, the signal will go like this. Now for each participant, we got a stream of data like this. So there's like one and a half, 1.2 hours worth of data. And that data is coming out of the watch. So we take data from a second person. So we're going to pair everybody up. We can compare those two signals using a method called wavelet coherence analysis. Without going into detail, it gives us overall measure of synchrony. So if two people tend to be moving highly together, the synchrony measure will peak, it will go up. And you'll see towards the end there, there's a, a little peak in synchrony between these two participants. Now, if we do that calculation for every pair in the game, every pair in the theatre show, um, we have all the actors, so the actors are A, B, C, D and F, six actors, and four children in this example, one, two, three and four. And if we line them up, we can colour in these squares depending on how synchronised they are. So over a whole two hour performance, we get a graph like this. Dark blue indicates really synchronised. So the actors, A, B, C, D, E, F, they're all dark blue with one another. They're all synchronised heavily to each other. The children less so. Let's look at the example I showed you here of actor B and child four. I've highlighted it with a little red square down the bottom. That's quite light. There's not a lot of synchrony going on there over the two hours. But if we zone in on a very specific few minutes, it's where there's a peak in synchrony. Just look at that and we'll calculate the result for that. So we recalculate that matrix for just that little tiny um, one minute sample. Now during that one minute, we see that these actors are all really dark blue. They're really moving together in sync with one another. The children, less so, except child three and four. And particularly child four is really blue, really synchronized with all of the actors. So what's going on here? Well, as an overview, um, child four is highlighted there, K4, and actor B, who we're comparing them against, is, is measured there, B. Now, the actors were up dancing at this time. They were moving around. Child four had very limited verbal ability, and at the time, to a non-expert, he didn't look like he was interested. He didn't look like he was engaged. He seemed to be wandering off in his mind. That's what it looked like to someone who hadn't, didn't know him. But when we actually um, looked at the video for that section of time, we saw something very interesting. Did you spot it? You can rewind the video if you like. He was moving his hand in time to the other performers. This doesn't seem like much, but it was a lot for him. It was quite surprising for anyone that didn't know him to see, oh, wow, looking back in the video, he was interested. He was following it. He was listening and he was watching. And we could see that just by the movement of his hand. So this tool allowed us to pick out these social interactions that previously we assumed were not happening. And that can be obviously useful for therapists and whatnot. We also saw um, child three interacting. Child three is the sibling of child four. So there, again, there was another social dynamic that was picked up by a simple movement sensor. So it, that's uh, that work, again, with Antonia Hamilton and Kelly Hunter at Flute Theatre. We're going to expand on that with a, another ERC project um, where we're going to take the project, the, 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 the methods and tools, into a school for autism, Queen's Mill School in West London, and um, apply them in the classroom to try and find moments where children are more or less socially engaged with certain activities that happen in the classroom. So it's as a teaching aid um, to help the teachers there.
what can science learn from theatre? Well, these are just a few examples of, of ways in which you can really see that social behaviours can be encouraged in theatre, like interactive theatre, like what, that, as, as Flute does, can really encourage social behaviours in people who otherwise would struggle with it. There's something very important there, and it's something that um, very often our studies in the lab, where we've got this sterile environment and a very structured conversation happening, won't quite reveal the truth about what's going on socially, um, particularly with autism and, and conditions like that. But it can, we can pull out these behaviours in theatre. So it's worth studying what happens in theatre. And to do it, well, we need unobtrusive sensors, wearables and, um, and such like. The experiences in theatre are repeatable. The use of actors um, allows us to explore, you know, the meaning of truth, what it means to, to, to perform something that looks truthful and believable. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of rich pickings in there. The interaction with audiences. What is it? What is this feeling of being live? Both actors and audience feel a difference when they're in the same room together. What is that? Can we measure it? Is it physical? Is it auditory? Is it something else? What, what is it? Um, can we study this? And I think it's a very important thing to study, particularly as right now, We've lost it. At the moment, the theatres have gone dark and we're all watching Netflix, but eventually Netflix runs out. They can go and film some more at some point, but what we might lose in this intervening time when people who are not earning a lot of money, in fact, they're earning nothing, and buildings which really only have one purpose are left for a period of time, the whole thing may atrophy and you know, we might, it might not recover in, in quite the same way. Um, and I think that's a shame because we've got a lot to learn from theatre and, you know, Netflix gets a lot of not just training, but it, you can't create films and telly without having theatre as a, 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 as a, a, a breeding ground, I suppose, for ideas and for um, entertainments. Now, theatre won't die. I, I'm pretty sure of that. It comes back, it'll rebound in some way or other. But some of the buildings might, and that might be a bit of a shame. So that's something I think we should consider in lockdown to see if we can um, have a look at how we can maybe support theatres. Flute theatre um, have managed to find a very interesting way around lockdown. So this change in routine that we've all experienced has been particularly disruptive for uh, many autistic people. Um, where routine and regular uh, life is a thoroughly important thing. What Flute have done to try and maintain this is to set up regular Zoom calls with the many of the children that they've been working with to try and continue doing some of these theatre games, but do it online. What, was, what we discovered quite early on, actually, was that in many cases, this works really, really, really well. And for some children who don't necessarily always engage very well in the room, they found that interacting with actors over a screen was actually more engaging for them. And they, they started to do more instances of mimicry and more instances of really um, coordinating with the performers on screen. Currently, Flute are doing an actual a run that you can, um, you, you can sign up to, to observe where they're doing a, a Shakespeare's Pericles. And for each performance, uh, one or two autistic children, so it'll be just one family, and they may have one or two or three children in that same window, but it'll be just one children, one window on the screen with a particular family or uh, class of autistic kids. And we'll, they'll do a full uh, performance for, that child, for those children. So far, there's been really quite amazing results from this, and um, it's it's helped both the families and the, the carers of many of these children, but also crucially helped these children because the the I watched one that the same children that, for example, did the um, the the study we did a few years ago with the uh, the, the movement study in the Bridge Theatre um, with the hand movement synchrony. Both of those children are now a few years older, and they both did the. Um, a flute performance and it was it was yeah it's quite tearful to watch this actually because they really really have come on amazingly and they're really engaged they remember many of the bits of the performance and they you know you can see things that we couldn't see with even with our sensors or in the theater we could see things like mimicry of eyebrow movement and eye movement things that we didn't expect to see at all um, so there's a lot of scope for science research now or my research in particular to look now at what can we, how can we use this video information to find 
moments of connection and engagement, um, even though we're all working on computers from uh, across the city and across the world. I'm going to end it there. I've talked for long enough. Um, thank you for listening, if indeed you have been listening. I have no idea. Um, apparently there's a chat box um, with a massive delay on it. So if anyone has any questions, I'll, I'll be online just um, you know, to try and answer them if I can. Um, and in the meanwhile, just thank you to many of my collaborators. I've, all of this work wouldn't have been possible without all of these people that I've mentioned here. I um, should highlight Terry Clark and Edmund Utigan were um, the Goldsmiths master students at the time who worked on the visualisations for deconstructing the dream. So they did a lot of great work on that and the audio that's created for that. Thank you very much. If you, if you have any questions after this, just send me an email. Okay, I have a question here from Matty Hoburn, uh, looking at uh, joint planning and looking at things like pupil size. Um, yes, pu pupil size is a good indicator of, of cognitive ease. This, um, there's a lot of visual and eye-based things that we've tried to study. Um, I have other studies on, on the use of the eyes and social interactions. One of the problems with pupil size is, um, yes, it indicates uh, attraction, it indicates um, the, the you know the, the degree of cognition. However, it's diurnal. It changes throughout the day, and any slight change in lighting conditions sets it off. So, under extremely controlled conditions, a very useful thing to look at. But it's very very noisy under most normal conditions. And I'm quite interested in can we do these things outside the laboratory in the real world and in the theatre? So pupil size wouldn't be so useful. One thing I did look at was blinks, though blinking um, and, and synchrony of blinking can be quite a nice indicator. Crucially, we did also a study where we had two people having a conversation. This was with um, KMD at Keio University in Japan, where we had two people having a conversation uh, back to back and found that they synchronised, particularly um, at like a one hertz, like a sort of heartbeat, they synchronised their eye blinks when they were conversing back to back, which is a very interesting thing. No idea why. Right, so Nicola Plant says, um, would you say performative movements that were rhythmic and repeated were mimicked by more audience with learning disabilities as they were an obvious strategy for engagement? So yes, there is something in that. So music and rhythm, uh, particularly for some, some of our participants, the music and rhythm components were the strongest things. And we really saw there were some kids who did not engage at all for anything that wasn't rhythmic, but the minute there was a bit of rhythm or music, they were on there. Um, and that was quite impressive. But there were equally cases where we saw um, mimicry happening and um, coordination happening where there weren't necessarily rhythmic things. So our method, although it is, is based on the idea of synchrony, it could be just like moving at the same time, not necessarily in rhythm. And we were we still found instances of that. But yes, that requires further study. Definitely more work on that area. Physiological signals. Alexandra Christian. Um, physiological signals. Yes. Do a lot of work with physiological signals. So um, I haven't talked about that here, but we, uh, well, rather Daniel Richardson um, and uh, Joe Devlin did a nice study a few years ago at uh, in theatre watching the musical Dream Girls, the musical, and they were studying heart rate variability and electrodermal activity, I believe, uh, sweat response, sympathetic nervous response, and they found correlations they, between people um, at the moment when the chorus came. So when there was a rousing chorus, everyone's heart beat together, essentially. People entrained to the music and to the situation and to the, the arc of the story, which is a very useful, well, very powerful thing and a very useful thing if you're a theatre producer and you want to find those little arcs in your story to really fine-tune to make sure your musical is a massive hit. But yeah, that work's ongoing and I believe 
Um, at the moment, I believe that uh, Daniel and others are looking at um, studying heart rate variability uh, over Zoom, like over uh, communications like this. Um, but I also have yeah, all sorts of physiological sensors that I like to explore, can talk more about that at length. Matty raises the point that in theatre, although the experiments are repeatable, um, it's yeah. How can you think of these performances as randomised control trials here? The control isn't obvious. Yeah, very true point. I, I mean, part of the it's it's very hard to control things. We can make we could design the theatre performance itself, like the script and the the particular the way things are going as to, to help us as we would design an experiment i think we'd have to rethink how we do experiments and we try and work our control into how the theater performance goes much harder to do i totally get that but um you know as an analogy what what we really want is like being able to study people in the wild in their real life and there you've got almost no controls so it's a little easier than that but that, that's that's work in progress how do we work on doing you know controls how do how do we control things Uh, looks like that's all the questions for now. Um, I'm going to thank you very much for listening, everybody. Uh, have a lovely afternoon. Enjoy the rest of the day. And uh, hopefully see you in real life at some point soon. Bye.